was at another meeting that he, um, the commissioner was uh, adamant that he be at. So we have Thank Elaine you, presiding. So I will run through the agenda. Um, so with the introductions, let's do people in the room. We have citizen member John Brust. You're going to laugh at me across the room. It's, it's complicated. It this is. Way. I know. <laughs> and, you know, we don't have. So John Brust, citizen member. Nancy Pearson, citizen member. Steve Rice, citizen member. Welcome to Andrew Curry. Andrew is representing Supervisor Crummy from the Town of Colony. Andrew is the Director of Operations and the Supervisor's new uh, representative, and he will be joining us when the Supervisor can't be here. You're welcome. We have Jess Scott Imahar with uh, TNC, the Nature Conservancy. Again, Elaine Bolchinian with uh, New York State Parks. Supervisor Barber with the Town of Gilderland. And that's it. So do we have any, I see we have Donna out here, president of the Friends. Um, Donna, if you want to give some comments under the comments from the public section. Um, before I do that, let's take a look at the minutes from the June 16th meeting. Anybody have questions or comments on those? Hearing none, is there a motion? Steve? I'll second it. John? Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Um, Don, before we go to you, I just wanted to make sure um, if we had any other members from the public, um, please uh, put your name in chat. We'll let you in. Don, uh, why don't you go ahead and give us an update from the Friends. Sounds good. Good morning, everyone. The Friends of the Pine Bush com community continue to support the commission and staff of the Pine Bush Preserve this past quarter. Uh, we provided financial support for a summer intern. We were successful in securing several grants to be applied to upcoming projects and events. Uh, we supported the Albany Pine Bush Preserve uh, through tabling, including the Nature Night Out events and the Saturday Nature Bus, which stopped at the Six Mile Waterworks. Uh, we continued support of Ticket to Ride, a program reimbursing school districts for the school bus expenses uh, uh, for children to attend uh, 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 and explore the pine bush. We sponsored several social events and hikes to get people involved and to uh, have them appreciate more the, uh, the closeness of the preserve. And the fall quarter promises to be uh, a very active one for the friends with uh, many events planned. Thank you. Great, thanks, Tom. Thanks for all your help as always. Um, Elaine, do you have anything that you'd like to share? Uh, no, other than, you know, well, well yes, I do. Um, I, I, I'm always delighted to be here. I regret Tony not being here. He's a, a, a wonderful um, leader. But um, just want to say, Chris, I'm, I'm, you know, really excited about the uh, strengthening of our of our partnership as we kind of dig into um, the parks agency's creation of what we are, I think, <laughs> finally naming the Big Bend State Park Preserve, um, which, as I think you all know, will be uh, highly focused on uh, the ecological needs of um, creation of habitat for the endangered permanent blue butterfly, as well as all the natural communities that it supports. So um, that's it. Happy to be here and thank you. Great, thanks Elaine. I can uh, also follow up on that just quick. Um, Elaine and I have been working with uh, our staff here and, and staff in parks and also in, in general council offices and parks to 
to develop an MOU so we can work and help parks um, with Big Ben, um, basically applying what we've learned here in the Pine Bush for habitat restoration, carnival and butterfly uh, monitoring, things like that um, at the site. Big Bend is um, a large parcel of land that's adjacent to uh, Moreau Lake State Park um, near Glen Falls. Um, so we, we're getting close with that MOU. We just got to work on some of the language and hopefully we'll get that done in the next month or so. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Other uh, board members have how big yeah. parcel is it? Uh, how big is Big Bend? 700? Uh, 860 acres. Yep. Thank you. And that's a dip on top of Moreau. Moreau is pretty big too. Moreau's over 8,000. Okay, so we're wrong again. 8,000. <laughs> so it's almost a 9,000 acre area. Yeah. Moreau, Moreau and if you look at it, if you consider Moreau as part of the capital district, it's the biggest open space park natural area that we have. And it, it doesn't get a lot of press for usage. This will. Any other uh, reports from board members? Yeah. Okay. Chris, um, I have one. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jessica. So the Nature Conservancy is working in support of the Environmental Bond Act that will be on the ballot this fall. Um, this measure will be important for um, the Pine Bush and other organizations and entities, both government, meaning state and municipal, as well as not-for-profit, who work on conservation of natural resources. It's a $4.2 billion measure that will appear on the November ballot. It's called the Clean Water, um, Clean Air, Green Jobs Environmental Bond Act, and it'll be Proposition 1. Um, the, there's a campaign in support of it, um, and there's also going to be public education going on. Um, so, Chris, I'll connect with you to determine if there are some materials that the pine bush can display in accordance with any rules that exist for your activities around such sorts of things. I think the state environmental agencies are getting guidance currently about how they can talk about this. Um, but from the non-governmental side, we're working on a campaign um, and people can learn more about it by visiting voteyescleanwaterandjobs.com and I can put that link in the chat for everyone. That'd be great, thanks Jessica. So that, um, there was a press on that today um, and it sounds like uh, there'll be a launch of a, of, a, of a strong campaign starting next week. And of that 4.2, my understanding is 650 million is for open space recreation. Um, and certainly this is being promoted uh, by a coalition of environmental groups across the state, but there's also, uh, I know there's a lot of, a number of building trades uh, organizations that are promoting this as well, like New York State AFL, CIO, uh, the General Contractors Association, um, among others. So I think we'll see quite a bit of press starting next week. We haven't seen any today. No. I think it's unless you're in the business, you don't even know it exists. No. It's it's been a little early. Um, people forget, and we had two primaries to get through. So yeah. um, we did launch the campaign yesterday, and you'll be seeing a lot more soon. Great. Okay. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, for my report, I'll keep it short. Uh, keep a look. Uh, make sure you take a look at the update in uh, board packet. Um, because I want to make sure anybody who has to leave early, they can see at least part of the presentation. The two presentations can certainly get to the action items. Uh, some of the highlights uh, going on is, I think you're familiar, there was a wildfire. There was actually three wildfires in Minnewaska State Park. Uh, the largest was the Napanock, which is estimated to be about 270 acres. DEC requested our support, um, our staff, and our equipment to help with that wildfire fighting effort. So. Tyler Briggs, our fire manager, uh, some of our staff and our partners, including two folks from the Nature Conservancy, went down. There was eight, an eight person crew went down. I think it was two weeks ago today. Um, that fire is contained, and I think it's out, but it's definitely contained. Uh, but it was nice to be able to help partners. Um, unfortunately, the, the governor's office missed the Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission as a partner in the suppression effort, but that's okay. <laughs> So we were happy to help with that. Uh, we're at like 269, 270 acres of internal burned uh, prescribed fires for the year, um, despite things getting pretty dry for a long time. And it looks like as 
as of tomorrow, Friday, we will be able to burn again. Um, with all the rain that we've had, we are now back in prescription. We have been out of prescription for a long time um, due to the, the dry conditions and the lack of uh, significant rain. Um, you see in Anything else I want to highlight? Uh, we've got some we got some recent press on bird banding um, and our bird work here, and also on fire, climate change, and how um, we participated to help. Again, at Minnewaska, Neil spoke to the press last week about that. Dylan spoke to the press about our bird banding. Um, I think everybody got the release from Wendy about that prayer warbler. I won't go on and on about because I've already done it. It's one of the oldest birds that is registered to the USGS, who manages you know, banding across the, the country, it's like the top four, so right now, eight grams. Nine times it's flown back and forth from here to Haiti. So, fascinating. Um, and I think I'll leave. Actually, no, I, I do want to mention one more thing. Nature Night Out uh, which was a, a program that staff came up with uh, where um, we did we decided to keep the recovery center open for extra hours. So we did it three times this year, one on a Wednesday, two Fridays. Uh, we stayed open from 4 till 7.30. We had some, sometimes some live entertainment, some music. We had a story walk set up. We had food trucks here. Um, and each time we had about 200 people um, and a lot of good feedback. So it looks like we'll probably do that again. Uh, so it's you know, a nice way to, people were, were happy to like get back and, and do things at this pandemic. Continues to kind of subside, I think. So, so that was good. So thanks to all the staff for all that together. Yeah, that, that was great. Uh, so I will leave it at that, and I will turn it over to Neil for the technical committee or project. I'm not sure where I should stand. Where you, you all don't have. To you can actually stand if you well. But then I'm you stand there. You don't need to be on the camera. You just good morning. Good morning. Uh, um, within your packet is the technical committee update. Uh, the technical committee has not met this quarter, but there are a few projects that we commented on uh, corresponding electronically and submitting comment letters. I just want to highlight a couple for you. One is the, land, the landfill restoration project continues to move forward. The city has finally be, begun the process of restoring the closed Crater Albany landfill and moving sand, moving sand and seeding effectively a horseshoe of deep sand the base of the GAL, that's step one. That's now been sand there, it's been seeded, getting established. Next year, they'll do the mid slope. Year three, they'll do the top. One correction in the update, uh, we have received their annual report. We've only received the draft of their annual work plan. So I'm actually meeting with DBT this afternoon to review, review their work plan. In the town of Gilderland, the Apex project, which was previously called Rap Road residential apartments, 222 units, partial protection area 57. Um, that project was subsequently purchased by another agency. It's now called the Apex at Crossgates, and that, that received final approval from the town of Gilman a week or so ago. One new project That's, uh, in the city of Albany down at Corporate Circle. It used to be Transworld. I'm not sure if it still is, but um, there's a page parking lot. They're redeveloping a page parking lot to create a small mix. All of that summarized in your update. And lastly, I almost forgot. They're reviewing the management plan. So staff have largely completed reviewing reviewing the plan itself, as well as all of the associated appendices. There are two that we're focusing on now that, that depending on the outcome, and conversations with the committee made update. One is the fire management plan, and the other is the education and outreach plan. And we're working with Tyler, Aaron, and Wendy to continue reviewing those and figuring out what are what what staff recommendations to the technical committee are going to be. Then we'll discuss that. And I hope to have a final update for you on where we want to go with the management plan update if you need one in the three percent. Any questions for Neil? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Lisa, financial report. Good morning. Good morning. 
You're okay right there. We got our numbers right. We got our numbers up. We got them up. All right. All right. So our numbers go to uh, July 31st, four months of our fiscal year. Um, on the revenue side, state of financial activity, dues and contributions are 3,900 dollars higher than budget. This is due to our quarterly mitigation, paying a little bit higher from trust bills. Sorry, quarterly trust bills, I should say that. Government grants and contracts are pretty much on budget, very close. Mitigation fees are $6,400 over budget. This is due to our national risk of deferred revenue being utilized um, in the first part of the year. Lease revenue is on budget for the year, and other revenue is $3,700 higher than due to sales and commercial. The revenue um, came in very close to budget to the market. On the expense side, uh, personal expenditure are under budget. Um, they're about 92 percent of budget, um, and this is due to some of the education um, seasonal position, and our benefits are slightly lower and will come in lower um, at the end of the year. So we have two um, full time positions um, that are not getting um, benefits, and a third that was budgeted for full time benefits. Um, Lisa, I'm, I'm, excuse me. You're, you're hard to hear. If you could move maybe closer to where the microphone is. Sure. Thank you. I think it's on the camera. I'd love to find it. I'll move over here. It's on the camera. Yeah, if you stand, if you stand to the side of the camera. I don't want to block it. That's all right. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, that's not that's better. I, thank you. Perfect. Um, on the travel and training side, we're just down uh, 88% of budget. We're just down across all departments. Um, that's just timing of budget. Um, contractual uh, is 91% of budget. This is all in uh, Discovery Center um, projects. The property management is one month behind the billing. And then this is our contingency budget based on repair needs. Uh, contr contractual, um, sorry, communication. Uh, this is all this is slightly over budget, and this is in advertising, and this is the timing of budget based expenses. Um, for the year versus our actual occupancy is $13,000 under budget. This is our utility line, um, and this is our timing of DC utilities mainly. Um, they will increase in the winter months, and as we know, all uh, utility expenses are on the rise, so we may even be over on the line. Uh, supplies and equipment are $7,000 under budget. This is $4,000 under your equipment that has budgeted that has not been purchased as of yet, and $2,500 in staff uniforms. Um, all other expenses are slightly under budget, and this is due to gift shop purchases, um, and this will catch up over the year. Total expenses came in at 91% of the budget. So our overall revenue came in close to budget and on the operating side, um, and our expenses came in under giving us a operating surplus of 121000 if we look below that on our non-cash side, uh, depreciation costs came in at 92,000, which is on budget, and our net loss on investment, which I'm sorry to report, second time only since I've been here, uh, $375,000. So our total change in that position is you know, $45,000 loss on that, including our non-cash. So any, expense, any questions on that? No? Okay. Over to our statement of net assets. Yep, okay. Uh, cash and cash equivalents are down $573,000, and this will relate to the grants receivable below, the line below that. We have not received a payment from um, DEC as of the end of July or April through July. Um, so we've utilized cash and we've increased our grants receivable. Our grants receivable is $816,000 more. Um, than last year, uh, again, and this is money owed from DEC. We did receive $470,000 um, in August, so it took this down a little bit, and we are expecting two payments very, very soon, um, one for April to June for our quarterly and one on an advance. Uh, accounts receivable are down $23,000, and this, this is due to our mid quarterly mitigation being paid. Inventory remains the same. And prepaid expenses decreased 102,000. And this is a line item you'll see in March every year for expenses paid that are actually occurring in the following year. So this is why this will show such a decrease um, from the following year. 
Um, investments decreased $375,000 due to market conditions, negative performance in all four funds. Uh, capital assets decreased $92,000 due to our monthly depreciation expense. Land, um, capital, uh, land stayed the same. We haven't had any purchases. And deferred outflows from retirement. Uh, this is our New York State and Local Retirement Actuarial Report. And this will change in November um, once we get our actuarial report. So that remained the same through July. Total net assets decreased $350,000, mainly due to increasing both cash and investments on that side. On the liability side, um, nothing really big here, $379 increase, um, just due to accrued expenses through July. And we have a decrease in deferred revenue of $4,600, and this is our national grid deferred revenue that we utilize, and this showed up in our mitigation revenue on our last report. So we have a total decrease of $4,200 in liability, which is very minimal through July. On the net asset side, total net assets, capital assets decreased $92,000 for depreciation. Reserved assets remain the same, and unreserved assets decreased $254,000, giving us our $345,000 in decrease. Um, this is our $121,000 operating surplus our $92,000 depreciation expense, and our loss in investments of $375,000. Any questions on that? On to investments. We gained a little over $50,000 from our April report, um, but we still lost $375,000. Uh, our reserve fund lost $87,000. Our discovery center endowment, $9,000. Our endowment, $258,000, and our um, OPEP reserve account, $21,000, giving us a total loss of $375,000. Any questions on that? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have two action items, two resolutions. The first is the election of officers. This slate of officers re-elects those that are currently serving. Uh, thank you for the three of you being willing to continue to serve as officers of our board. So the vice chair, Elaine, would continue. Don would continue as secretary, and John would continue as treasurer. Are there any questions? Anyone else wants to volunteer? Well, I'm told. <laughs> is, is there a motion? I'll make that motion. I'll second. Is that Peter? Yep. Thank you, Peter. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 It seems like we have multi multi year vendor contracts at every board meeting, which is there's two uh, multi-year contracts here. Uh, this, the first one is for Italian Global Services. That's our custodial vendor uh, that cleans and maintains the Discovery Center and the entire building. Um, this is for a one, another one-year extension. This is the last one-year extension that we're going to do. We will go out to bid next year. Uh, and they have maintained uh, reasonable prices throughout. This current one is full. It's a slight increase from last year, so five less than five thousand four hundred forty-four, up from forty-five and change to a little close to fifty a year. Uh, and that would run from November first to the end of October next year. Again, going out to bid next year. Uh, the next one is it's called a mini bid contract. Um, there's these mini bid contracts that you can go through in New York State. Uh, you fill out the form. Um, my name is on it, but Blake, she's uh, our Discovery Center manager. She does all the legwork for all the Discovery Center contracts. Um, this is this is for uh, trash. Uh, this is for waste hauling, so the trash and recycling. County waste. There's only two bidders. There's waste management, county waste. County waste is the lowest bidder. Um, and this is a three-year 
we've reduced county waste for three years. Their contract ends at the end of October. This would be a new three year from November 1st to October 31st. Can I answer any questions on those? Okay. Okay. Chris, one question on the three year contract. Does County Waste have escalation clauses? No. I'm tied in. Yep, they're tied in. They, interestingly enough, it almost doubled. So the current monthly rate is like 70, 77 80, and the new monthly rate is up 142, and they're still the lowest bidder, and the increase is the cycle. Recycling went from six bucks, yeah, six oh three a week to twenty one eighteen a week because of the drop in and the market for recycling. Which is why you see if you have home pickup, why you're seeing things go up too. But there is no escalation clause. It's not. It's it's set at one three two. Any other questions? Your motion. I'll make it. John. Second. Nancy. I'll second. Uh, any discussion? Comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, before we get into our presentations, I just there's two things I wanted to add. Um, in the update specifically, we have two position vacancies, and I've been working with Aaron. Final, our education program director. Okay, thanks, Jess. Um, so we have two vacancies. Uh, one is the education program manager. Uh, that person vacated the position after 11 years uh, to take a new position uh, that's closer to home. And another position, the science education specialist, that person was in the role for two years, and that person has left for graduate school. So we kind of looked at that in the education department and some needs in the Discovery Center and come up with some mild restructuring. Uh, so we're going through interviews now, and once we get that all figured out, it'll be budget neutral, or certainly very close to budget neutral, and I'll provide an board chart once we get that done with the center so you can see the changes uh, that we've done. And one thing I forgot, um, Jesse Hoffman, our preserve, our preserve steward and botanist, was uh, nice enough to get me numbers because I asked how many miles of perimeter are there for the preserve. Because in the update, one of the things Jesse and the, the seasonal stewardship staff have been doing is putting up new boundary signs around the preserve. So there are 31.5 miles of preserve boundary abutting private property and in total 72 miles. 72 miles of preserve boundary. Not all of which has to be posted, but a lot of them. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So with that, I can stop sharing and ask Tim and Amy to jump in. You know, do you want to introduce the project at all? It's in the update. Okay. No, I think. Yeah. I don't want to take Tim and Amy's time. That sounds good. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I'll jump right in. You can. Yeah. Um, I'm Tim Howard. I'm with the New York Natural Heritage Program. And Amy is here, too, um, also with the Heritage Program. And we'll talk a little bit about a project Neil brought us on to do, and that is to create a new uh, land cover classification for the pine bush. And this is really relevant for, for management and seeing what's going on on the ground. Um, and so I'll try to be quick and um, uh, through the beginning and have a little bit of interesting sort of deeper dive at the very end. But I'll start off, then Amy will go, and then and then maybe I'll pick up again. Okay. Can you see this single sort of front cover slide? Yes. Great. Okay, so our goals were to create a, um, a land cover map, that's sort of the vegetation types and whatever types we have, for um, 2021, and then use that land cover map to make a new uh, uh, sort of natural community glommed together uh, map of the same area, and then look at change um, from 2017, where we, we did this once before in 2017 to 2021. <laughs> so um, I'll dive right in at this first step was creating this land cover map um, from satellite imagery. And so we got, um, uh, Neil worked with a vendor to um, collect imagery from 
uh, April and September of last year. And this is really high resolution uh, uh, sort of satellite. It looks like aerial photos, basically, satellite imagery. And it looks like this. And so there's, there are the boundaries in, in really pale yellow and, um, and then really, really high resolution satellite imagery from April and from September. And this is, includes uh, uh, the color bands as well as infrared. And so we can make very interesting uh, indices derived from them. And so there's the, there's the discovery center in the upper left of every one of these images. And then you can make something called the normalized difference vegetation index and a wetness index and a greenness index. The top row is April and the bottom row is September. And actually, if you can see the, the, the green here on the left are, the, are um, pitch pine trees. And then the bright spots that come out on many of these other ones are actually shadow. The shadows de, um, uh, cast by the trees um, on the ground. And so the shadows actually do come out as a problem sometimes. But it's really interesting the way you can, you can pull out different things from the imagery. And I'm just showing you this because these layers are something that Neil has access to now. He provided them to Neil and he can use them in some of his analyses. Um, so that's that. So we use that information to model what's out there, to use computer modeling to, for example, um, model what's, what's, where is the water on the landscape? And so we train a model to say, okay, where is water out there? Um, and then use that information to give us an exact location for, um, uh, for the, the part of the land cover type that's, that's water. And so there's the, you know, the, um, the six mile waterworks is down, down here and, um, and the other ponds and things like that. So we, we, we do those 10, ten a subset of these cover types separately, um, just in our focus area. And, and that um, comes out to the roads and rooftops, which is impervious surface, the golf courses and um, mowed lawn areas and some other things like that. So you get a map like this, which then the white areas are still unclassified. And I bring those all together to classify them into um, uh, model them together and ending up with um, a final classification that looks like this. And so this is a, the whole study area includes all the parcels of the pine bush plus um, areas in the area, you know, other areas in this focus spot and, um, and includes, so it's a cell by cell, a pixel by pixel, which is a half meter by half meter sort of estimate of what's there on the ground. And then what we wanted to do, what Neil asked was to say, okay, can we turn those into the natural community types that we're tracking um, over time that, that the pine bush is tracking as well as, as well as the heritage program tracks over time. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Amy to talk about that section. Okay, so you can go to the next slide. So uh, traditionally community classification involves a lot of on the ground, uh, measurements. So part of what we did in 2017 and the idea of repeating it in 2021 was working with Neil and our uh, chief ecologist, Brad Eggenger, to come up with a way to take the land use classification map and uh, extract from it uh, information uh, about relevant landscape features to be able to turn a map of pixels into a map of communities. So if the, um, as I'm pointing with my finger, <laughs> the uh, items across the top, you see there that say percent wetland, percent mowed lawn. There are ways of taking that land use map and uh, creating measures of what we consider sort of relevant habitat features. How wet is it? How forested is it? Is it surrounded by a lot of open habitat? And then for some of these specific habitats, you know, how much scrub oak is there? How much uh, black locust? Uh, and then we had a set of rules that we developed based on those features to transform each pixel from being a white pine pixel to whether or not it was part of actually an Appalachian oak pine forest. Um, and in some cases, like the those first three rows, the open water, the impervious surface, the ag, it was just we pulled directly from the land use. Um, but for things like the pitch pine scrub oak barrens, uh, that you had to meet certain criteria to be part of a barrens. You had to be in an open habitat, 
Um, so I either had to grass or scrub oak or bare soil, at least 34% in your 15 meter radius. He had to have some scrub oak, but not too much scrub oak. So between 12 and 50. And this year, the, the purple, uh, we actually were able to pull out of the land use, which we didn't have in 2017, um, this measure of sort of shrubby brambles, primarily rubus and things like blackberry. Uh, so we actually had an additional community classification this year we didn't have, which is this, uh, that purple one, secessional shrubland. Uh, and so that was used to denote areas that were open, that didn't have a ton of pitch pine, but did have uh, a certain amount of rubus. Uh, and then for our, our four forest types, we looked at Appalachian oak pine, which was kind of, is it forested? Does it have pine and does it have more white pine than pitch pine? So often the criteria weighed the different specific trees um, and they were done iteratively. So if something fell into the first category, it was already classified, we moved on and uh, classified them in order. So if you didn't meet any of these criteria, you ended up at unclassified, which was very few. Uh, and so these are the exact same, with the exception of that purple rubus, we use the exact same criteria from 2017 for 2021 so that we could compare uh, sort of apples to apples to see how the landscape has changed. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, we can uh, see how that looks. Uh, so sort of the open habitats we're looking at, like our pitch pine scrub oak barrens, our pitch pine scrub oak thicket, and the grasslands are the light, the light tan, as I point at my screen again, the light tan, uh, the sort of dark orange, and then the light green, those are sort of the open areas. Uh, the forests are the, the bright green, the bluish green is pitch pine oak forest. Um, the pink was sessional southern hardwoods, that's just a legacy from when 2017, we wanted to be able to really stand out so that Neil could see where the locust was, which is why the forest is pink. Uh, but one thing that you might notice is this was done on a pixel by pixel basis. And so before we could get to a map of communities that we could uh, analyze, we had to think about the fact that a couple of cells of pitch pine that might indicate a pitch pine tree don't necessarily make a pitch pine forest. So especially in the open areas, you can see very small dots of, of orange, and very small dots of, of light green. And that's not really a, you know, a, a little bit of grass is necessarily a field. So we had to come up with a set of rules to sort of smooth out uh, the boundaries. Um, one of the most obvious ones, even though it's not a target community, is if you look at the golf course, there are trees on the golf course, but those trees are not part of a forest. Uh, so we created with our ecologist, Brett Inger, based on his community standards, sort of the minimum community size that you would have. And those are listed in our table on the next slide. And we went through iteratively and took clumps of cells that were too small to be considered a forest. You reassigned them to the uh, communities that were adjacent to them um, and went through removing and smoothing until we got to a final map of the communities where they all met those minimum size standards. Uh, and that's what's on the next slide. And so this is our 2021 community maps. So you can see, again, the golf course smooths out all of those just become a part of that lawned area. And you can see in the open areas in the southern part there, you know, they're more large cohesive community boundaries as opposed to small little patchy uh, dots. Both of those products Neil has, he has the unsmoothed and the smooth versions. Um, because Sometimes you just want to know what's on the landscape as opposed to sort of the um, smoothed out boundary. But we use this product to do sort of our assessment of uh, community composition and to compare 2017 to 2021, um, we looked at the same product in both years. Uh, and then the little um, ring map just shows you proportionally on the landscape, uh, how much of the landscape was made up uh, of each of those uh, communities. And I think on the next slide, if you want to go back and forth, this is what the same product looked like in 2017. This is our 2017 map. Uh, and this is our 2021 map. Uh, <laughs> How much should I go back and forth? How's that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so they may get, get the picture. We can get Neil has both products. Uh, and I think the comparison by type is, boy. so one of the things that we were able to do this year is because everything was classified on a pixel by pixel basis, we could look at every point and look at the transition between what it was classified as in 2017 and what it looked like in 2021. So this, 
somewhat alarming table just shows you, for example, the first row is wetland. It's not necessarily a managed community, but it was all the pixels in that row were classified as wetland in 2017. And everything in that column that's also wetland is what it was, classi was classified as wetland in 2021. So if we go down to the bottom two rows, you can see that we had 614 total acres of wetland in 2021 compared to 40, 437 in 2017. So we have a net change of almost 200 additional acres of wetland. Um, this was, and if we look in the column, if you go up, see that there's 128 acres that were successional northern hardwood forest that are wetland now. And so in this case, it's likely that the imagery we had just did a much better job of distinguishing between forest and wet woody wetland forest. So we have an increase in wetland, but not maybe not necessarily due to management, but because of our classification. But the totals on the bottom sort of show you where we had biggest changes in overall cover of the different community types. Um, one of the biggest increases, 394 uh, acres of pitch pine scrub oak thicket. Um, and most of that came, if we look up from pitch pine scrub oak barrens uh, that was converted to thicket and successional northern sand plains grasslands that was grassland in 2021 and thicket, grassland in 2017 and thicket in 2021. There was overall a lot more uh, pit, uh, scrub oak on the landscape this year. And so we saw a big increase in those open scrub oak uh, dominated communities. Um, and most of that shifted from northern sand plains grassland. You can see that that uh, dropped off by 630. So it's transitions among open habitats, but a lot of the um, scrub oak uh, was increased. Uh, and if we want to look at the next slide, you can sort of see in general how the uh, composition changed uh, by total area. And this was areas that were used in both classifications in 2017 and 2021. Um, it's important to take that the boundaries uh, were slightly different of the two study areas. Um, so in this case, we're just we're comparing apples to apples, just areas that were included in both classifications. Um, so one of the things you can see, the outer ring is the area in 2021, the inner ring is 2017. You can see again, the light blue is the wetlands. You see a big increase in wetland classification. And then the next three categories, you can see how in 2021, you have a lot more light tan and orange, which are your pitch pine scrub oak barrens and your pitch pine scrub oak thicket compared to 2017, where you had more uh, sessional northern sand plains grasslands and not quite as, not quite as much thicket. Uh, we also see there's a big change in that bright green, which is our Appalachian oak pine forest, uh, which is probably an ability of the imagery to better pull out white pine versus pitch pine, which was sort of the distinguishing in our classification, determining whether or not you were a pitch pine forest or an Appalachian oak pine forest was the relative proportions of white pine to pitch pine. And one other way to look at it, this is that same very colorful table we can also look at it from more of a functional perspective. So instead of looking at just if it went from grassland to barrens, we can think of, okay, did it go from an open habitat to a forested habitat or did it go from an open habitat to a different kind of open habitat? So this is that same table, I've just regrouped them. So any kind of transition from open to open looks like this light tan color. The open to forested is a dark green. Um, we can see those are habitats that have increased. Um, the forested habitat that's gone to open is the bright green and transitions between forested habitats are in brown. Um, so those are more functional changes on the landscape and we can see what those look like in the next map. Uh, so here is a map of preserve and it's showing the qu quality of change from 2017 to 2021, whether or not it went from an open habitat to a forested habitat, those are the dark green from forested to open, you can see those big large areas of bright green. Uh, and then within your functional category, the open types that transition to di different open types are the tan. So that's a lot of those areas where they went from Northern sand plains grassland to pitch pine scrub oak barrens. You see a lot of that in the South and then transitions within forest types are brown. If it's gray, it meant it stayed exactly the same community as it was uh, before. And then Tim, I think has some, uh, specific examples of what this looks like on the ground. 
yeah, this is, I mean, this is fascinating, I think. And it's really, really interested. And, and in some, and, and there's different sort of functions related to why some of this is going on. And so I really wanted to dive in just quickly for, for you to talk about the, these two uh, green changes, the open to forested shift, like what's, what's going on? We, we're not letting things grow necessarily here. And the forested to open shift, um, which, uh, and so let's look at that a little bit. So here we go, um, zooming right on in, just uh, the top uh, image is, is uh, just sort of a locator. So I'm looking at the um, area just below the Discovery Center. Um, and on the left is 2017, and on the right is 2021. And you can actually see, you can see exactly the same trees in both images. Um, so we're looking at exactly the same spot. And you know there are these clumps of pitch pine, that's the red. This is called a uh, false color or, or infrared um, imagery um, or, or toned that way. And then it's mostly open, it's open um, scrubby or, or, uh, or um, uh, meadow between them, sort of classic, classic um, pitch pine open areas. And so if we look at that, so that classified to um, uh, and the left the, our, is our classification for 2017 and on the right is for 2021. And notice all the pitch pines came out as the green here, slightly different colors, apologize for that, but they're much more uh, blobby. And the separate, the single canopies came out as single canopies, but on the right, the classification tended to uh, glom them up a little bit more. And so I'll go back, I'm gonna go back up just to the imagery and well, maybe there's more space between the trees on the left um, and maybe the, it was picking up on that and maybe the trees grew a little bit more, but I think in part is really just sort of the methodology and the way the trees came out that they turned out to be um, a little bit uh, globbier, a little bit patchier in the sense that the patches merged together uh, with openings between them. And so, what you re so if you take that classification and merge it up the way um, uh, in our next step, you end up with more of it classified as sort of the forest type and, and, and less of it classified as the open type, even though it really wasn't that different. So I think in this case where we had open to forested, a lot of the open to forested examples in this analysis was sort of a result of, um, of the way, the, the, way this, the, the modeling process went. And so that's a good uh, lesson learned and that's something that's important that we need to think about and like, how will we um, apply this and extract this and look at the changes that way. So that's kind of interesting. So open to forested, maybe it's a function of the way the classification worked out. Um, let's look at forested to open. So here's, now we're down just by, just uh, you know, west of the north way. Actually, you can see the north way on the images a little bit and next to the, and basically next to waterworks. And this is a place where uh, the crew has been doing some work. So in 2017, all the red dots are, are pine trees and all the darker gray is actually, this is a January image. So these are actually full forest. This is, these are trees without their leaves on them, um, deciduous trees on the, on the left-hand side of the 2017 image and some open clearing on the right-hand side. And in 2021, this is again a leaf off image. It's the April image and it's all cleared um, some, sense, some, some fabulous management going on there. And that translates over to the classification where again, all the purple is our mixed deciduous forest and our tree patches. And again, we still have our tree patches but a lot of open showing up and that classifies to much more open. That's the orange here. And so, um, the forest, this is a classic forest to the open example. And I think a lot of this is what's going on when we picked up that change, forest to the open, and that's true management actions. And so I think we, can, we need to think, um, think about how we interpret these changes and, and, um, and I think they're useful, but also we should think about what's the root and how did it all work out. So that was sort of a deeper dive into those, into some of the changes that I think should really help, um, help us think about how, how it's all applied. That I think was it. So thank you for, uh, thank you, Neil, for, for putting this together, for bringing us on to do this again. And we will really look forward to thinking hard about, about diving in and, and using this to help, to help you guys support um, what's going on on the ground. If we have time, happy to, happy to talk about any of this if the folks have questions. Yeah, that's great, Amy and Tim, thank you. Um, folks have questions for Tim or Amy? Fascinating.
I can't yes. span it. Yeah. Would, um, so what's the what's the next step using this data to help us manage the pine bush better, or 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 track animals that are in the pine bush, or or or, or track our success in terms of managing the landscape, et cetera, et cetera? What's the the next practical step? How will you employ this? Okay, John, that's a great question. Uh, a, a number of ways. One of the first things we're looking at doing is combining this land cover change analysis with a bunch of our wildlife data, in particular our bird data that yeah. Steve Dillon and I collect preserve live. So we're looking at working with Amy and Tim to co-publish a paper looking at that wildlife change over time. The imagery helps reinforce, at least for the management plan update, evaluating how much of each of the natural community, ecological communities that we have, we are less on the ground so we can track change, but also targeting future management. We see where we still have the plant scrub oak barren, and we see where we still have black locusts that needs to be removed. Um, it's helping us fine tune some of our prescriptions where we want to keep things more open. And some of the examples that Tim alluded to are a function of the computer modeling. Some of them are actually changes on the ground where what was grassland or fish line scrub oak barren is becoming more forested. So this is going to help us target those areas to make sure that we're keeping them as open as we want to be. Thinking about hundreds of butterfly metapopulation dynamics. What, where are our next best opportunities for creating more corner habitat? So it's yeah. it's going to cascade through all, all of our management. Yeah. You're turning the knobs, basically. Right. So part of it is an accounting exercise of what have we done and what do we have now to keep track in our progress, but also it's really helping us fine tune our prescriptions moving forward. I did forget, I meant to point out that the, the uh, session of Southern Hardwoods, the black locust dominated community is less than half of what it was in 2017. Um, so that on the ground, know. yeah, it, it looks like you're doing great. I'd like to use this information to tell me the best spot to put my deer stand. Oh, <laughs> 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 we can combine this with Dylan's wildlife cameras. Yeah. <laughs> 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 But uh, since, uh, since I have the floor for a second, I just again want to say thank you to Amy and Tim and Greg, who's not here. The three of them are just three phenomenal scientists and combined their, their, their combined skills are really helping me better understand this ecosystem and then helping us, as I said, fine tune our management. So thank, thank you very much to the Heritage Program staff. Steve? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Amy. That, that's fantastic. I'm used to thinking of these things at longer timescales. Yeah, it's years. so cool. It's so cool to be able to kind of take that short-term snapshot and see how dynamic the ecosystem is. So it's it's really uh, interesting. One of the things that, that occurs to me that would be potentially valuable is to map this on uh, on some of the, of the the management that that has occurred during those four years to try and get a better idea how much of this, even at a kind of coarse scale, how much of it is due to natural successional processes, how much is, how much of this change is due to prescribed fire. How much is due to the, 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 the kind of logging and uh, uh, other kind of extractive things going on? It'd be interesting to kind of overlay those and get some idea of, you know, even on a, in a in an aerial sense, you know, what percentage of this change is is caused by some of these different uh, different activities? I mean, uh, it, clearly, uh, something you, you can you can do quite easily, I would think. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And and the great thing is that Neil is tracking where he's doing what, right? And so I think we should, I think that's a perfect next step is to really look harder and try to dive in on on, on, on how we can, can document um, from totally independent, right? This is independent assessment of what's going on on the ground. And so I think that's great. Yes. One of the interesting trends that, that they picked up in this assessment is the transition of Former locust clones that would restore to successional sampling grass prairie, right? And we want those becoming more barren. Our goal in most of those sites is not grasslands, but barren. They're picking up on that transition even within five years. And if you remember, Professor Corbin was here a year or so ago with some of his research, and he was noting that he wasn't seeing a whole lot of scrub oak or oak regen in those grasslands. He emailed me last week, he's going back out to those sites, and his, his comment was, wow. I'm seeing scrub oak and oak regen everywhere in those grass. So to a large extent, the transition that they picked up on at, you know, called satellite focus of these fields to, to more woody components, we're actually seeing on the ground. 
So it, it, some of it is successional um, change and a whole bunch of it, of course, student management. <coughs> Any other questions for Tim, Amy, Neil? Great. Thank you both. All right. Thanks very much. Thank okay. you. Next up, we have Dylan, our sort of college entomologist. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks very much for this opportunity to kind of share some more of our ongoing research. Um, so I'm gonna talk this morning briefly about um, one of our newest um, projects, which is tracking uh, Eastern towhees and their kind of habitat use. So you may remember, I think it was back in 2019, I talked to you about um, the MODIS network um, and how we have MODIS towers on our roof. So the MODIS wildlife tracking system um, is a kind of global system that's used for tracking animal movement. Um, and it kind of automates these radio receivers. So um, it's radio telemetry, which traditionally would be done with researchers out in the field, carrying around Yagi antennas and following signal strengths to try and triangulate exactly where tagged animals are on the landscape. Um, so this is kind of flipping that on its head a little bit and uh, making those receivers stationary. So as the animals move over, they get detected by these receivers. Um, and so this method is really good at looking at large scale movements. So. It's really focused on looking at migration patterns. Um, and these tags um, that are used in this system have put up, been put on largely birds, but also small mammals like bats and even some insects like uh, common green darners. So we currently have two of these MODIS towers on our roof. Um, so we do have the two towers on the roof. Um, this big giant one is uh, the older frequency. It's 167 megahertz. Um, so that one is on the tower or on the roof. And our newest tower um, is uh, 464 megahertz. Um, and that is our kind of newer um, tower that is helping us with our node network. So again, this is really focused um, for animals that are flying over the towers. It doesn't do super well with detecting animals underneath the towers because there's a lot of signal interference. So this method, like I mentioned, is really good at looking at like large scale movements. Um, and so this is the map that I showed you in 2019 when I presented about the MODIS network. So each one of these little uh, yellow markings here are where MODIS towers are located. And then those fun little loopies um, are visual representations of uh, the detection radius for each of the antennas on the roof. So we each of our towers has four different antennas that are pointed in the cardinal directions. Um, so this is 2019. And here I just downloaded this map yesterday. So you can see that um, we're really filling in. Um, this is a pretty big project. Um, a lot of the work in the Northeast is a result of the Northeast MODIS Collaborative, which is really kind of focused on working with local agencies and local landowners to create these fences across the state so that basically a tagged animal can't cross the state without kind of crossing this fence and being detected by one of the MODIS towers. So you can see here, um, this is the fence that's kind of being worked on in New York State. There's one up in Maine, um, New Hampshire, they're working in Massachusetts. So this is really filling in um, and really expanding our ability to study migration, animal migration. But again, I mentioned that if you wanted to look at more local uh, habitat usage by these animals, this network is not the best tool, um, but <laughs> you can work with this system, uh, within this system to um, create something that is that can help you look at those more local movements. So we worked with cellular tracking technologies to install these little mini uh, radio receivers and repeater units. So we call these nodes. Um, so each one of these has a little solar panel on top, and they communicate to each other and via the MODIS tower on the roof uh, via a cellular network. So these, um, as you can see, they're much smaller. They're um, with these, each one of these red dots is where they're located in the Carner Barrens East region of the preserve. So the Discovery Center is located um, in the upper left here. Um, 
So these nodes need to be within about a kilometer, kilometer and a half of the MODIS tower in order to communicate with them effectively. Um, and we put our nodes about 150 meters apart. You can put them wider, but we have a lot of topography out there. Um, and we were a little concerned with signal interference. So we kind of erred on the side of caution and put them a little bit closer. So we have 33 of these nodes that are deployed in Carner Barrens East. And so these are basically kind of little mini antennas that are gonna receive those signals, but on a much um, smaller scale. So we can actually look at how those animals are using this little piece of habitat. So our study animal for this was Eastern Tohees. Uh, you may be familiar with these guys. They're uh, very prolific in the pine bush. And so they were a species we figured we wouldn't have trouble catching <laughs> enough of them. Um, so these are the tags. These are these are um, life tags, which they're called life tags because they're kind of expected to last for the life expectancy of the animal. They have a little solar panel on them, um, which is great because it lowers the weight of the tag um, and because uh, it doesn't have a battery. And so we uh, put these on the birds. They've got these little, you can kind of see it a little bit here. There's a little, we make these harnesses out of jewelry cord. Um, and they go, there's a little leg loop that goes around each of the legs, and then this tag sits right on the rump of the bird. So last year we tagged 10 towies inside of our network, um, and those towies stuck around for the season. Um, and what's really great is we can see um, live whether, like, we can go to the MODIS uh, website and we can look at live detections of these animals. So I just looked this morning and uh, Yesterday, uh, we had seven of our tag towies were still around. Um, this morning, it's detected four of them so far. So they are starting to move. They're starting to uh, to leave uh, for the fall. Um, but it's really cool that we can see that information live just to know if our birds are here or not. And I was very excited this spring to see that all 10 of our towies that we tagged last year returned to this node network uh, this year. And they were here all summer. So super great. Um, and with the support of the, the friends successfully applied for a 3M grant this year that was able to fund purchasing 10 more tags um, and a few backup nodes for our grid. And so we were actually able to, we deployed two more tags on TOEIs this year. So we have a total of 12 TOEIs that are tagged inside of our node grid right now. Um, and like I said, about seven of them are still here. So they're starting to move out, um, but, What's really cool is when we start to look a little bit closer at this data. Um, so this is very preliminary. These points might shift a little bit because we haven't calibrated our system yet. But so this is just to give you an idea of what the data looks like. So rather than having a scientist out there with an antenna trying to triangulate these birds and maybe get like a point every day or two, these nodes are collecting data continuously. So it is an incredible amount of data. Um, and this is an example of what that looks like. So. This is uh, from June 15th to June 17th of last year. So each one of these colors is one of the 10 tohis. So you can uh, kind of see what's what's interesting, you know, and what we'll start to analyze as we calibrate the data and look a little bit closer is whether or not these birds are really actually maintaining territories on the landscape or they're just free for alls. <laughs> so we can kind of click through. I'm going to click through here and we're going to go into uh, July. So you can kind of see it does really seem that some of these birds are sticking to territories, um, even if there is a lot of overlap. Um, so there we are in July of last year. We'll skip ahead here to August. You can kind of see we're starting to lose some of the birds. So that could be uh, post-fledgling dispersal after the babies have hatched and fledged. They may be taking them to other areas um, to forage. Um, and then, of course, as we go through the fall, we have less and less detections until finally in about mid-October, I think it was, uh, all of our towhees had left. So this is hopefully going to teach us a lot about how these birds are using this landscape um, and also a good pilot study for how we might apply this uh, technology to other animals. So in, in the future, this would be a really great way. Right now, we um, we have uh, tagged whippoorwills with GPS tags, and that gives us that kind of uh, very um, uh, distinct scale of how they're using the landscape. But the problem with that method is that we have to recapture the birds in order to get the tags off. Um, and uh, we did have some problems with that last year. 
So it would be great if we could use this technology with um, Eastern whippoorwills because we don't actually have to recapture the birds to get the data. We would also really like to put them on prairie warblers. This is um, from our previous work. We've determined that prairie warblers are our best avian indicator of high quality pitch pine scrub oak barrens. Um, the tags aren't quite small enough yet, um, but we're hoping that at some point they will be small enough to deploy on our prairie warblers um, and even other species entirely. So spotted turtles are a species of greatest conservation need that we have in the preserve. And we are curious how they are utilizing the landscape, um, especially because they're considered a wetland turtle, but we find them in the uplands. Um, so this is a really cool kind of cutting edge technology we're on here and we're really excited to, to learn from this. Um, so thank you so much to the friends for your work in securing that grant. Um, and thanks to the commission for supporting this work. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any. Amanda, how much does a tag cost? Ooh, that's a good question. I wanna say they're around 150 a piece. But I'm not sure. <laughs> I could look that up. Let's see. And the nodes are like 300. Yeah, the nodes are like 300 better. They're not, they're, for the technology that you get, they're not very, really very expensive. Plus, like, they're supported by a grant to 3M that's a friend of life. I love the solar panel. <laughs> um, no, a phenomenal job with that presentation. The only thing I want to add, and one of the reasons why we wanted to do this is to be able to evaluate how our management influences the birds that breed here, right? Toeys, toeys are a migratory bird. They breed here and they go to Florida, the Carolinas for the winter. They're short distance migrants. Whereas like the prairie workers are too long distance migrants. We're the, we're, we're the nursery for those animals, for those populations. Understanding how our management is influencing these species both of which are declining precipitously throughout that range very well with it. So really helps piece together the management we're doing here within our globally rare pine barrens for species that only use our pine barrens for a critical part of their life cycle. So being able to piece all of that together with our management is one of the things we really hope to be able to do with this technology. Amanda, I've got another question too. With uh, the, uh, the, local, uh, the local system, does, does that uh, transceiver or transponder, whatever it is on the bird, does that also work with the, the uh, larger scale system? So you're getting both uh, fine scale and large scale information about their movement? Yes. Oh, yes, cool. I will say, um, so that map that I showed you was both frequencies. Um, a lot of those towers are still on the older frequency. Um, and so there, there hasn't been a huge push yet to move to the newer frequency. But yes, we could detect both uh, frequencies flying over. And we have this fall, we've so far we picked up a semi palmated plover flying over and also a chimney swift, both, both of which were, were originally banded up in Quebec. So oh, and I. Track, you can track the animals that you're, or the bird, the towies that you're, <laughs> you're tagging here. You can track them all the way to South Carolina if they go through the MODIS network. Well, <laughs> we thought we thought we could. Um, and then, of course, we I, I had this realization that um, they're solar powered, their tags are solar powered, and these birds usually fly at night. So unfortunately, no of our none of our towie has have yet been detected on other modus towers, likely because they are flying at night. Um, and during the daytime, they're below the towers. So the towers just aren't picking them up because of signal interference. But Theoretically, that should work, <laughs> but doesn't work so well when the tags don't work at night. Um, I did find so the tags are two hundred dollars and the nodes are two hundred and fifty a piece. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah. Are there questions for Dylan? No. Thank you. That was Thanks. great. Thank you. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, we uh, for other business, Aaron, do you want to? You want to jump in and sure. get, you have to stand close to the camera because that's where the microphone is. Oh, okay. You don't have to stand in front of me, you can hide behind it. <laughs> I don't want to block the camera. You just want your voice to be picked up. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Good morning, everyone. Just a quick update on our Discovery Center Grounds project. Um, so back in 2017, 2018, we started taking a close look at the grounds around the Discovery Center and any improvements that we would want to make in terms of safety, accessibility, um, also visitor experience. And we did some planning work at that time. Um, we're ready to get back into that. We 
our grounds committee has been um, getting together recently and resuming the planning process. And um, we've learned a couple things over uh, throughout the pandemic. Certainly, as people have experienced the pandemic, they've preferred to be outdoors as opposed to coming indoors. So that's a big shift that has happened um, recently. And also looking for more economical alternatives to what we can do on the ground. So we're ready to um, resume that planning process. Right now we have an RFP posted for um, the landscape architecture design services to help us with that. And um, the posting just went up, it's due October 4th. So we'll be looking to um, bring somebody on to again, work with us to fine tune uh, the plans that we have and to come up with a phase, um, a phase plan and also a budget that works well with our budget. So what I, I asked Aaron to do is um, for the reports that we do from the beginning of the meeting, remember when we were building the Discovery Center, we had Mike Venuti was giving the report every quarter. So Aaron will do that as far as we're going forward with the grounds. So. Are there any questions? Okay. okay. Thank you. Anything else for folks? No? Elaine, excellent job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I learned going back to, I think it was Keith when Keith first started, how difficult it is to try and remember that everybody's name, even if you work with them for 20 years. Uh, so, so, do we have, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. Nancy. <laughs> Second. Okay. Steve, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We'll see you December 15th. Thank right. you. Thank you. I think what we need to do is we need to run the speakers through these. It's hard to hear. Particularly with the air handler on. When Wendy breathed in because she had some personal stuff to deal with this morning, breathed in, set everything up, and she had to leave. So that's why I ran out. She's leaving. I'm like, how do I how, how do I turn up this this hardwood? Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to hit leave on this? <laughs> uh, you can. No, when you're out in the ocean and.